this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to set up a daily soil water balance calculation for the purpose of scheduling irrigation. This is based on the Chapter 11 problem set from the Rain and Shine textbook. You can see I have an Excel spreadsheet here. For now, let's ignore that. I've also copied the problem statement here on the right hand side. Let's take a look at that. The problem says, imagine that you are responsible for scheduling irrigation for a corn crop. Your management goal is to keep the corn well watered so that the evapotranspiration from the field is equal to the reference or potential evapotranspiration rate. Now we have not yet discussed the reference evapotranspiration rate in the textbook this far. Uh, this idea is brought up in the next chapter, chapter 12, but for now, just know the reference or potential evapotranspiration rate is the rate of evapotranspiration for a well-watered surface and vegetation under the prevailing atmospheric conditions. This means that when we're considering the potential or reference evapotranspiration, we're essentially assuming that both evaporation and transpiration are meeting the uh, atmospheric demand. The problem goes on to say that you should create a spreadsheet to perform a simple daily soil water balance for the field in order to determine the number of irrigation events and the total irrigation amount that is required during a 120 day growing season. And there are, are a number of assumptions that are listed here. But before we move into those assumptions, I would like to just give you a moment to pause the video, open up Excel, and copy down what I have shown here. And then in the rest of the video, I will show you how to develop the soil water balance by filling in the blanks. All right, so now that you've had a chance to set up your spreadsheet, let's begin looking at some of the details that are given regarding the problem. The problem statement says that the root zone is one meter deep. The soil is a silt loam with a field capacity of 0 0.23 centimeters cubed per centimeters cubed and a permanent wilting point of 0 0.09 centimeters cubed per centimeters cubed. And the problem says that the soil is at field capacity on day zero when our water balance will begin. So first, let's just fill in some of the values that we were given regarding these soil hydraulic properties. So we're told that the soil depth is equal to one meter, and you can see here that all of our calculations are being done in millimeters, so we will convert one meter to millimeters which gives us 1,000 millimeter soil depth. We're told that our field capacity, or our upper limit, is 0 0.23 centimeters cubed per centimeters cubed. We're told that our lower limit, or our permanent wilting point, is equal to 0 0.09 centimeters cubed per centimeters cubed. In order to do all the calculations that we need to do, we need to know the available water capacity, or AWC. And if you recall from the textbook, this is just the difference between the upper limit and the lower limit. So that is 0 0.23 minus 0 0.09. So if you do that, you should get an answer of 0 0.14 centimeters cubed per centimeters cubed. And then finally, we need to know the maximum allowable depletion. And if you, again, recall from the textbook, this is half of the available water capacity. So this value is 0 0.07. Now notice that all of these values are given in terms of a volumetric water content. Well, I said previously that we need to consider all of our values in terms of millimeters. So now we need to convert these values from volumetric water contents to 
values in millimeters. So this would be equivalent to uh, the soil water storage at each of these points. Now in order to do that, we just need to multiply this volumetric water content by the depth of the soil, which we have here. So we have here, setting up this equation, you just type in the equal sign, and then you select the cell that you want. So we have 0 0.23 multiplied, so now you use the asterisk symbol. So we have 0 0.23 times, and then now we select the cell that has the 1000 in it. So we have, at the field capacity, our soil water storage is 230 millimeters. So we need to do the same thing again for the remaining three values. Multiply 0 0.09 by 1000. And we have that the soil water storage at the permanent wilting point is equal to 90 millimeters. Do the same thing for the available water capacity. We find that that is equal to 140 millimeters. And then once more for the maximum allowable depletion. And we find that that is equal to 70 millimeters. Also, notice that on day zero, the initial day of our uh, simulation, we are told that the soil is at field capacity. That means the soil water storage is equal to that at field capacity. So here we have our initial soil water storage, and we know that that is going to be equal to 230 millimeters, the same as our field capacity value. Now let's consider the rest of our environmental variables. So you should have a column for day, a column for the reference or potential evapotranspiration. Don't forget to include units on each of these columns. We have a column for rainfall, a column for irrigation, a column for soil water storage, a column for the fraction of the available water capacity, and finally a, so a, a column for soil water depletion. Now, we're told that there are 120 days in the growing season. So let's go ahead and fill in 120 days. So we have day one, day two, and now you can select both of these cells and you see there's this small box in the lower right hand corner. If you click that box and drag you can see that Excel will fill in the values here. So we need to go down to 120. So now we have 120 days in our simulation. In our next bullet point, we're told that the reference evapotranspiration rate starts at two millimeters per day on day one of the season and increases by 0 0.1 millimeters per day each day until day 60, after which it decreases by 0 0.1 millimeters each day. So here in our reference ET column, we're told that this begins at a value of 2 millimeters per day and that this increases by 0 0.1 millimeters per day for 60 days. So let's do the first half of the season first. So we know that day two is equal to day one plus 0 0.1 millimeters per day. And just like we did for the day column, we can select day two and drag it down. And remember, this is only for the first 60 days. So we will drag down to 60 days. So we have a peak reference ET 
of 7.9 millimeters per day. Now, after this 60th day, we're told that the reference ET begins to decrease by 0 0.1 millimeters per day. So on day 61, the reference ET is equal to the previous day reference ET minus 0 0.1. And then once again, we can drag this down to day 120. Very good. All right, we have our second column filled in now. What about the rainfall column? Well, the problem statement says that a rainfall of 12 millimeters occurs early in the morning on day 7, day 14, and every seventh day after that for the duration of the season. And all of the rainfall infiltrates into the soil. That just means that we don't have to account for any runoff. We're assuming that all of the rainfall infiltrates into the soil. So we're told that on day one, there is no rainfall. Same for day two and day three, all the way until day seven, when there is a 12 millimeter rainfall. Instead of clicking and dragging, that won't work in this case, but we can copy and paste these seven days throughout the growing season. So you can see now we have a rainfall event on day 14, another day rain, uh, another rainfall event on day 21. And if we continue copying and pasting, this trend will continue throughout the entire growing season. All right, so now our rainfall column is filled in. Now for right now, we're going to skip the irrigation column and let's move on to looking at the soil water storage. Now on day one, the soil water storage is equal to the initial storage plus any rainfall that the soil has received plus any irrigation minus the reference ET value. So let's write an equation that allows us to calculate that. So we have that the soil water storage is equal to the initial storage value plus rainfall plus irrigation and minus our reference ET value. Now, once you have that equation that looks just like that, press the enter button, and that will tell you that for day one, the soil water storage is 228 millimeters per day, which makes sense because initially on day zero, the soil contained 230 millimeters of water, but on day one, two millimeters of water were lost to evaporation and transpiration and there were no additional inputs of water so the final soil storage for day one is equal to 228. now on subsequent days the soil water storage is calculated in the same way but instead of using the initial soil water storage, we use the soil water storage from the previous day. So on day two, the soil water storage is equal to the previous day's storage plus rainfall again and plus irrigation. And once again, you subtract the reference ET value. So we see once again that the soil water storage is simply the difference between the previous day's storage and all of the water inputs and outputs from the soil. Just like we've done for the other columns, let's go ahead and select 
this little square here and drag this value down to day 120. And don't worry that these values are negative right now. When we fill in our irrigation column, that won't be the same. Now let's move on to looking at our fraction of available water column. And the fraction of available water is calculated according to equation 11.3 in the textbook. And this just says that the current, uh, that the uh, fraction of available water capacity value is equal to the current storage minus the wilting point divided by the difference between the field capacity and the wilting point. So to calculate the fraction of, of available water capacity for day one, we take the current soil water storage, and notice that I'm using parentheses to, do, to differentiate between the numerator and the denominator. So we have the soil water storage minus the wilting point, so this is the lower limit, divided by the difference between the field capacity, or the upper limit, minus the wilting point, or lower limit. So when you do that, you should have a fraction of available water capacity value on day one of 0 0.99. Now notice that this fraction of available water capacity equation relies upon the values of the field capacity and the wilting point. And remember, in the past, when we drag down these equations, it also changes our cell references, meaning that these cell references will move if we just drag this equation down. So we want to tell Excel that we don't want these values to move. And one way to do that, to lock these cell references in place, is to use the dollar sign symbol, so Shift-4. So if you put a dollar sign symbol before the column, that locks the column in place. And if you put another one before the row number, that also locks the row in place. So we're going to do this for both our field capacity and our wilting point reference cell values. And then we press enter. So nothing changes here but it will change when we drag this value down. So if, for example, if you drag this down to the next row, we see that the cell references haven't changed, but the very first reference has now moved uh, from soil water storage on day one to the soil water storage of day two. So now that we know that that's working, let's go ahead and just drag that all the way down to day 120. And again, those negative values will go away. Now finally, we have this column that is the soil water depletion. And for each day, this is just the difference between the storage at field capacity and the current soil water storage. So we have, this is the difference between the storage at the field capacity here and between the current soil water storage. And again, we need to make sure that our reference to the field capacity doesn't change, so let's go ahead and add in those dollar signs again here. And now, once again, we can just drag this down to the bottom. Now let's consider our irrigation column. We know that the field is initially at the field capacity. So on day zero, the soil is at field capacity, which means no irrigation is going to be needed on day one. However, we don't know 
on subsequent days whether or not we will need irrigation. The problem statement says that each irrigation event will occur on the last day possible to maintain a fraction of available water capacity greater than 0 0.5. The water added in each irrigation event is enough to restore the profile to field capacity based on the soil water storage at the end of the previous day. Now to calculate whether or not irrigation is needed on subsequent days, we need to consider the sum of the soil water depletion from the previous day, as well as the current day's reference evapotranspiration and rainfall rates. Now if the sum of these values is less than the maximum allowable depletion, then we need to apply irrigation. Now to express this in our Excel spreadsheet, we need to use what is called an if statement. So type in the second day in the irrigation column an equal sign and capital if. And you can see here uh, a box pops up that will help you fill in this if statement. So we begin with the parentheses and now it tells us that the next thing that we need to enter is some sort of a logical test. And I said that if the soil water depletion from the previous day plus the current day's reference ET value minus the current day's rainfall, if this value is greater than the maximum allowable depletion, then we need to apply irrigation. So if this is true, we need to apply irrigation. And how much do we need to apply? Well, we need to apply whatever the value of the soil water depletion is from the previous day. However, if this if statement, if this logical value here is false, then we don't need to apply any irrigation at all so the irrigation value should just remain zero. Now if you press enter, you see that for day two, no irrigation needs to be applied because we have not yet decreased the soil water storage to the maximum allowable depletion. Just like our other columns, we can go ahead and drag this down However, before we do that, remember that we are once again referencing the maximum allowable depletion, so we need to lock this cell reference in place, just like we did previously. So go ahead and add in the dollar signs there, and now it should be locked in place, and you can drag this column down to 120 days. Once you do this, as you scroll up, you can see that now there are certain days when irrigation events have been created for you, essentially. It tells you the day on which the irrigation should be applied and the amount of irrigation that should be applied. So now we have filled in all of our columns and we have the irrigation information that was requested in the problem. So now we need to find the number of irrigation events and the total amount of irrigation that was required during this growing season. So let's look here through column D, the irrigation column. So we have one, two, three, four, five, so five total irrigation events, and to calculate the total amount of irrigation, you can use the sum function here and just calculate the sum of all the cells in column D, and you should get a total of 323 millimeters of irrigation water that need to be applied during this 120-day season in order to prevent water stress in your corn crop.